Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 28, we're going to take a look at why matched tubes are so important. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, this isn't the most sexy topic I could have chosen, but given how many matched tubes I've been shipping out lately, why not talk about something that can have a huge impact on sound quality in your tube preamp or power amp? Let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of matched and unmatched tubes. Well, obviously, if you have matched tubes, your left and right volume will be balanced or equal. And that will help a lot with the stereo image. And if the stereo image is good, there's a very good chance that the sound stage will be, will be there, will be present. Now, lots of things affect the sound stage. A speaker placement is the number one. In fact, everything will affect this presentation. But let's just, I've talked about this a lot in the past, let's just say that if you have unmatched tubes, there's a very good chance that this is going to be all messed up or not present at all. Also, many modern preamps, they don't even have a balance control. Back in the day, it would be almost impossible to have bought an integrated or a preamp that didn't have a, 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 a balance control. In fact, we, we had these really funky uh, volume controls years ago. There were these big knobs in which we had two sections, and they would have a detente in with the which they would be clicked together and then you could break the the left and right channel on the volume knob to adjust your balance. Never liked them. I always thought that there was really a clunky solution. Anyways, what about SE, single ended class A power amps? They often don't have a volume control either. Now, of course, you would use that volume control to balance out the amps, right? Now, if they've got cathode bias, then the tubes have to be matched. Otherwise, you're definitely going to have a difference in volume. Okay, what about PP or push-pull Class AB amps? Typically, they take a quad of output tubes. Even if the bias is easy to adjust, like with uh, the Wilsonton R8, the sound quality will be at its best if you start with a matched quad. And lastly, what about tube longevity? As tubes age, if you had, let's say, uh, a vintage um, set of power tubes and one of the tubes is really a mismatch, sure, you can adjust the bias to bring it in line with the other tubes. How long is that tube going to last? It's probably going to die long before the other three. And now you've got a trio, which is not very good for, for a power amp that's a push-pull. In fact, that reminds me, if you've got a seller uh, for your power tubes who has a lot in stock and you're buying, let's say, um, a vintage tube that's now 40 years old, ask, ask them if they can supply you a matched fifth tube. It's a good investment. In a year or two from now, if you lose a, t lose a power tube, you'll be good. You'll have, a, you'll have a spare. My rule is if you have a spare, you'll never need it. And if you don't have a spare, well, you can finish that sentence. Okay. Moving on. Now, when I did the first test uh, film, filming of this video, it took forever because I explained the various ways to test tubes and what the formulas meant and how you got them. And there's just not enough room in this video for that, enough time. So maybe at a future date, we'll go into more detail. Let's just hit the high points and get into actually looking at tested tubes. So. As fast as I can do it, the most common testing parameter is the mutual conductance. The short form from that is GM. Same thing. What is GM? It's the ratio of change in the plate current that results from a small change in the grid voltage. The important thing to think about this is as we change the operating point of the tube, we change how it emits. And if we if we test our tubes with those two key parameters and we compare them in a ratio, 
we come up with a number that we call GM. Now, there's two, two numbers you'll see typically used as a GM. One is a nominal number, so nominally 100 would equal 100% on most of those testers, mine included, though there are exceptions. I have a special section uh, that I've built on my tester to do 6SL7s properly. My nominal for a normal 6SL7 is 80. And for a mil-spec high output version, it's 100. And the reason why I had to downgrade my nominal from 100 to 80 is that my, my meter would go off scale with the higher testing tubes. The other, the other number you'll see is a big number, like 2200 micromoves. And if you, if you see that, it's going to be a lot harder to understand what that means. Hopefully the seller tells you 100% equals, let's say, 2200. And I've had both kinds of testers, and personally, I much prefer the nominal relative number of baseline of 100 or 100%. I find it easier to deal with. I've got all of the testing data and numbers for, 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 for um, what a normal tube would test in as a GM number, what its micromoles should be. And I, it's, it's so hard to remember these big numbers and keep them up straight in my head. It's so much easier to work with a nominal 100. And I think for customers, that's really the only way to go. That's my personal opinion. You can convert um, back and forth between the various systems. That's actually not that hard to do. Okay. So if GM is the common, you can test preamp tubes, power amp tubes, driver tubes. You can get the GM off of virtually any tubes. What if you see a tube that's going to have a number like this, 33 milliamps? What about a tube like that? Typically you see that on a power tube. What is that? That's the emissions of the tube. That's how much power the tube is outputting in idle. So no signal applied, no audio signal applied to the tube. It's measured in milliamps, of course. And the important thing to take away from this is that the GM test, the emission test, and all tube tests are done on a fixed operating point. And the point of that is to be able to compare one tube to the next. When you get one tube off of tester, unless you've got lots of experience or lots of inventory to compare it to, it really doesn't mean very much to you, does it? But if I've got 20 or 40 tubes off the tester, all of a sudden I can see really quite quickly what is the crazy tube in the garbage. What is the weak weak tube? Oh, that's in the garbage as well. And now I can start matching up the good tubes. And we'll look at that right now. Okay, let's get some tubes up. Okay. Now these are the EL34s that came with my Wilsonton R8 integrated amp. They're rebranded. I'm pretty sure they're Chinese, but I'm not 100% certain. I don't stock a lot of Chinese tubes, so I don't have anything to compare them to. And when you when you only put your manufacturing name on top, um, there's just no way to know unless you have a tube to compare it to. So right off the bat, they've only had about 12 hours of burn-in, and I've only got an hour or two of listening to them, and they just sound awful. So I put them on the tester after that first session months ago to see what exactly was going on, and the numbers really tell the story. So right off the bat, one tube burnt out um, with only maybe 14 hours of use. Now, it burnt out on the tester. You might say, whoa, maybe your voltages were wrong. No, I've got all my voltages are staring right at me on my tester. They're all fixed. They're controlled. They're regulated. I can see what they are. There was no problem with the voltages. This this filament burnt out probably right in front of my eyes. Garbage. Brand new tube. When that happens, that always calls into question the, the quality of the rest of the tubes. So let's look at how they test it. 112 on the GM, so that's a good high number, right? If 100 is nominally new old stock or new, let's say. These are new tubes. I work so much with vintage tubes. Uh, I, everything is NOS, right? 
New Old Stock, NIB, New in the Box. Those are the watch words that I'm using. Uh, I, I, I do test new tubes fairly often, but the vast majority of my interest in business is vintage. To me, that's where the best sounding tubes are hiding, is with uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, even 70 and 80 year old tubes can sound absolutely fabulous. So 112 on the GM, 127, 120. So look at the lowest number to the highest. So that's 15 over 112. So we're, we're talking about roughly a, a difference of um, maybe 13%, right? That's a little bit out of what I would consider uh, acceptable. 10% is a, is a good number for a matched uh, set of tubes. 5% is close matched. 1% is perfection. You don't need perfection with your tubes. 5% uh, is my goal. Uh, but with very old tubes or rare tubes, 10% is perfectly acceptable. So the GM is out. What about the emissions, the milliamps that these tubes are putting out? 27, 33, 44. Look at the difference between the lowest testing and the highest. They're nowhere near close. No wonder they sounded awful. In fact, there's only one place for awful sounding tubes, in my opinion. Okay, that felt better. <laughs> okay, let's look at a quad. There's a quad here somewhere. Let's look at a quad of really lovely, my, with some of my favorite EL 34s. These are original, not reissue, original Svetlana's. Now, you might notice one, two, three, four. That's actually V1, V2, V3, V4. That's the position they go in the amp. It's, I number them if I've tested them in a real listening uh, situation so that if somebody buys this quad, it's easy for them to see, oh, well, I'll just start at one end of the amp. This will be the left channel, perhaps. One, two, three, four will be the right channel, just like that. That's how you would plug them back in. That's how I arranged them. I thought that was the best arrangement. It's easy to think of quads as four tubes matched, but in fact, when you're testing uh, power tubes especially, I think in terms of pairs. So I would start off by matching up pairs, like this, and then I'd have a dozen, perhaps a dozen pairs, and then I would match the pairs to make a full quad. So let's look at them as pairs. 105 in the GM, 104, that's very close, that's less than a, a percent, 32, 34. That's also really good. Now, because the milliamps on these tubes is, is a third of 100, we've got to multiply it by three. So the difference is two, so that's roughly 6%, right? Um, there's more latitude for movement on that lower number, but 6% um, is great. What about over here? Well, 106, 107, again, that's very tight, 33, 34, very, very tight. How do they compare as a quad, though? So the lowest GM to the highest is 104 to 107. So that's less than 3%. That's, that's golden, folks. And 32 to 34, that's 2, so that's 6%, right? Um, now, I just pulled these at random from the bin. This, this is probably the tight, this is probably, it was just an accident. This is probably the tightest uh, quad of Svetlana's I've ever put together. And it's just an accident. I'm, it was a happy accident, right? I tried to do it. Uh, and I keep a lot of these tubes in stock so I can try to match them up. But anywhere inside of 10% is going to be good. Your amp's going to sound great. You're not going to notice much difference in sound difference. And somewhere close to five, that, that's golden. That's, that's, that's audio nirvana. That's what we're aiming for. But when we're talking about 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 year old tubes, we can only work with what we've got available. And it's tough to get more than 20, 30, or 40 tubes in at the same time to match up. Okay, what else can we look at that'll be kind of illustrative? How about my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, 6SN7s, the Sylvanias. These are the GTAs. The GTB and the GTA are virtually the same tube. The base type is a little different. One is shallow, one is tall, though they crossed over. Uh, the, the only real difference 
is um, is the heater warm-up period. Let's look at the numbers we've got here. Now, for preamp tubes, I find that really the GM measurement is all that I need. You could test these for emission. I don't think it's required. Some people do, um, but I get good measurement. I get good good matches using just my GM measurement. Because remember, the GM takes into account the ratio of the the grid voltage to the plate voltage and the emission that results. That's your GM. So the emissions are buried in this um, in this calculation. The reason we, why we take the emission separately on a power tube is that it's so important if we're matching up uh, a pair or a quad of power tubes that we, we dial in that emission fairly close. Okay, especially on a push-pull amp because Without match tubes, to keep it brief, without matching the power tubes up for emission, we're going to have distortion on the push-pull. Okay. 98, 97. What's that? Why have we got two numbers? Well, this is a twin triode. So there's two tubes inside one envelope. And as a result, we've got to test both sections. So the first number is always the first section. The second number is always the second. You just keep it, keep it that way. Now, some testers get it backwards, and, and in the case of my tester, it actually does it in the reverse for some reason. But I keep the convention in the same direction. My test button number one is always the first number, and as long as you keep it that way and organized, you'll never get confused. And the second tube is 97 and 97. So those are really close. I mean, the worst, 97 to 98, that is just a hair over a percent, right? Now, that's not that common. But as I said before, five is golden, five percent is golden, ten percent is good. Let's look at something that is off, though. Okay, this, these are some of my favorite tubes in existence. They're Meltz tubes, M-E-L-Z, Moscow Electric Light Company. They're all these metal base tubes are all from the 1950s. I think I, the latest I've seen is 61 or 62, and the earliest I've ever seen is 1951. Though I'm pretty sure they go earlier than that. Now these are 6SN7s. The 6SL7 is a very similar tube, same era, same base type, and same glorious sound. But what about our numbers? 101. So that's that's new old stock, right? Or brand new. 112, well, that's acceptable. That's even better, right? But there's quite a difference here. That's 11%, right? So that's just outside of my acceptable parameters. But what if we had another tube that was arranged the same way, 100 and 112? Ah, would that work? It will work fabulously. Look, we're 1% we're on the first section. Remember, it's the first section of both tubes that will be handling perhaps the first stage on the left channel and the first stage on the right. Same circuit, different circuit, but identical electronic components, right? And the second stage would be 112 and 112. So that, if you have good actual testing numbers and they're organized like this, that is perfectly acceptable and that'll work just fine. It might hurt your aesthetics to see those numbers on the, on the test, on the testing um, tabs, but just take them off and forget about them. It'll sound absolutely, your amp won't care. Your amp will say, oh, that's a balance too. It's good testing balance too. It'll sound great. Okay. Okay, enough about matching tubes. Here's something that I've been exploring for a long time. <laughs> You've seen this tube a few times. MWT. What the heck is, is that Mullard? Um, wireless and telephone. That's what I thought at one point. Uh, and um, somebody online thought that as well. And God, I must have spent three hours researching this one tube. And finally, uh, somebody jumped in on the last video and put a comment in and said, Jim, you know, I think that's actually Marconi Wireless and Telephone Company. And I said, oh, well, we better do some more research. 
And up until now, I've only found boxes that were nice looking boxes that had MWT, but no writing as to what the heck that is, which is not unusual. <laughs> Anyways, um, I went back and I did some more searches online, burned another hour up, and finally I found a box that had the logo MWT on it, just like that. Let's get it on camera clearly for you. And it had Marconi Wireless and Telephone Company on it. So thank you to uh, one of my listeners. Uh, he had it right. And um, we, I now know that this whole batch of tubes that's hopefully going to go into a prototype monoblock design that I'm working on, that they're actually Marconi tubes, not, um, not Mullards. Okay, let's put that somewhere safe. So what came in this week? Um, well, a whole bunch of Coke bottles. Let's back up. These are big tubes. Now, they actually came in in a large uh, collection that I bought a while ago, and it's, it's going to take a year or two to go through this collection. Um, but I had a customer ask me about 6v6s, and I said, well, I better get into the 6v6s. So there were... Ooh, I don't know, 200 tubes to clean and test. It takes, it took all week. Especially with vintage, uh, vintage used tubes come in dirty. Um, and it takes a lot to screen them, test them, uh, get them into inventory, figure out who the manufacturers are. Anyways, um, these are commonly called Coke bottles. And the 6V6 and the 6L6 actually look very much alike. In fact, if the if the designator is missing, often the only way to figure it out is to put them on the tester, uh, turn down the tester, and figure out what the measurement is. And often the 6L6 will just blow the meter right up. And you'll know right away, oh, that's a 6L6. Or if it's very weak, you'll say, oh, that's probably a 6V6. Anyways, formerly this is called um, an ST type, which sounds like a really complicated kind of way to describe it too, but it actually... S means shoulder, T means two, so it's a shoulder tube, right? So, <laughs> anyways, um, so there's lots of these that will go in the store sometime this coming week, hopefully. And a lot of standard 6v6s as well, a uh, huge quantity of them actually. And here's, here's an interesting one, I just thought I'd show you one. Look at the these are, of course, beam-powered tetrodes, just like the 6L6, and uh, you probably know the KT88. And these 6V6s were very, very common power tubes back in the day. They were in car radios, they were in tabletop radios, they were in console amplifiers, and um, they're still a great sounding tube. I actually have a single-ended uh, pair of monoblocks that play 6V6s in the best examples of the 6v6 rival any power tube, in my opinion. Lower output, but uh, great sounding tubes. So what the heck is this? Hit Ray. Isn't that weird? Well, that's Hitachi and Raytheon. And the two companies formed an alliance at some point, and um, they jointly issued tubes. And I think they're all made in Japan. Now, I think the reason they did that was probably at the time labor was cheaper in Japan. Raytheon was based in the U.S. Uh, and of course Hitachi was in Japan. Um, but the thing to take away from this is that the Japanese had a lot of a lot of their tube factories was set up, were set up by Philips or Mullard. Mullard was owned by Philips, of course. So quite a bit of the tooling is Philips or Mullard tooling, which is gold standard in my opinion. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And the Japanese uh, have always had an affinity for high quality audio and they're very finicky manufacturers. So the quality of these of the Japanese made tubes is often really good. It's hard to find a lot of them over here, but when you do and you get a matched pair, it's well worth trying them out. Okay, now if you stay till the end, here's some discount codes. Remember, I have flat rate $20 shipping around the world. I just shipped a box off to Australia and it, I managed to get, it actually qualified for free shipping. Uh, I managed to get it to Australia for a reasonable price. And the reason for that 
is that tubes don't weigh a lot. That's the secret to shipping. It's still expensive to go to Australia, but um, at least I can manage it. Uh, so if you spend $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.